this is Peter Hewitt, La Artistino, back again with part two of my colour along. As you know, we started this picture in Joanna Basford's Enchanted Forest of the Duck Pond. And we've reached this stage so far. If you've missed the first part, please go to my video on YouTube and um, have a look part one and watch that first. Now, as you remember, we've finished this area here the sky and the reeds and, and the mother duck and the baby ducks and today we're going to be working on this side of the picture. I'm going to start off with the stonework here. Now I've decided to go with the colour grey for this and the colours I've chosen is a polychromous warm grey number no. 5 for my darker grey and I've got the polychromous warm grey number no. 2 for my lighter grey. I'm also going to be using the Derwin Artists Blue Grey, which is a colour which I highly recommend if you're going to buy open stock colours, this is one of the ones I recommend. You don't find the equivalent in very many other colour sets and it is very useful for shadows. And that is what I'm going to use it for today. Now I'm going to start this colouring process by using the Blue Grey of the Derwin Pencil Range by starting off giving a little bit of shading. I'm going to use this pencil just to lay down all the shading in the rocks before I start. So I want to go around the bottom area of the rock here, around the bottom where the frog sits, and just shade up a little bit. This will add some depth to the picture once the other greys have been added. So we'll just make it a bit darker right down the bottom and gradually lightening up as we go up the rock. Now I'm going to pretend here that the side of the rock ends just underneath where this stem is. It's a convenient place to stop. So we'll just go up a little bit higher. There's some base shading, just using some light little circles towards the end to fade it out. And a bit darker down the bottom. Don't want to go all the way up, about two thirds of the way is fine on this side. Now as this rock here is exposed, I just want to sort of end the shading around about this far in. So we'll add that around the side of my frog. And there. around here so it's all evened out. Okay there we go. I think that's about right. Okay now I'm going to switch to the lighter grey. This is the warm grey and I'm going to add some lighter colour around the top. Now I'm going to leave a little bit of white along the edge there as you've seen me do in previous videos just to uh, give the feeling of the sun striking the rock. So I'll go almost to the way, all the way to the edge, but not quite. And I'll give it a little halo again, get a bit darker, sort of just inside where I've begun shading, and then lightening off as I head towards this blue bit. A little bit under there. Now to bring the two together, I'll be using my warm grey number no. 5. And starting down here in the blue, I will colour all over the blue to tint it grey. Because the blue, the rock isn't actually blue, it's just shadowed, so that's why I've given it the bluish look. I'll bring that up around the frog. As so until I join up with the warm grey at the top and then I will lightly blush it into the warm grey to create a colour gradient. So it'll be a bit lighter around here where I anticipate the warm grey would be and darkening down to meet where the blue is where the colour is more dense and dark.
Now I've chosen to do these rocks in grey. You may like to do them brown or red or any other colour that you see rocks being. Again, colour nice and dark over the darker blue down the bottom to create the shadow and then lightening up as you get to the light grey towards the top. And that's basically what we're going to do for the rest of these rocks. The only difference being because these rocks are underneath the water line you won't have the sun striking them so I won't be leaving that little halo of white on top. Once again I'll take my blue grey and I'm going to go around and add some shading. Now because these rocks are sort of slotted together there's going to be a little bit of shadow at the base of the rock but there's also going to be a little bit of shadow at the top where the top of the next rock sort of curves into the crevice there between the two rocks. So this will help to give the rock a bit of a rounded look. So I'm going to do both sides. Now on this uppermost side I'm just going to leave it as a single line there but on the bottom side of this rock I'm going to extend it so that it's more of a a shadow at the bottom. Again, both sides here. This side directly underneath is going to be a little bit smaller and then the side on top will be extended up a little bit as it is the underside of the rock. Do this for both sides of the picture, but for the time being we'll just work on this side just to save confusion. If you would like you can do this to the rocks on the other side as well, but I won't be doing that until I get to a later video. continue down. Again in between this little crevice where the two rocks meet I'm going to make it a bit shadowed just to give the feeling of the rocks curving into the crevice. All the way down being careful not to go over the fish or the plants down the bottom here. And I think I'll do a little bit along the side here. It's making it a bit lighter at the top here. So it gives the feeling of it curving round, but also the feeling that there is some light striking it, so it's not going to be quite as dark as what it would be down here. And just shade in a little bit around. little circles so that you don't end up with the streaky looking pencil lines. I do hope that um, windy noise isn't being picked up by my microphone. It's um, a typical kind of summery, late summery day in Geelong in February it's hot and there's a very hot northerly wind blowing, very scorching. It's one of those days that if I hung the washing out I'd be put it, pulling it off the washing line as soon as I'd finished hanging out the basket because it's so hot and dry that everything dries within minutes. But quite frankly I don't want to go out there. <laughs> I'll melt. <laughs>
Another thing you'll notice actually is that I've made the shading darker on this side than I have on that side. It's a little bit darker and it extends further and that's because I want to give the impression of the light striking the rocks through the water in this direction. So this is like a, th a thinner line of shading and this is a thicker area of shading. I'll continue down through the rest of these rocks. There. I'm pretty happy with those rocks now so I will continue to finish them off as I did the rocks at the top. Okay once again I have my warm grey number two. This time because I'm not leaving a halo of light around the outside I'm just going to blush in some of the warm sort of in the upper right hand side of the rocks, getting a little bit denser in the middle and then going out at the sides to create a, a warm part where the light is striking the rocks. And just splash it out towards the sides a little bit softly and make it a little bit more dense in the middle. This so might be a bit hard to see because this is quite a light shade of warm grey. Again, a little bit tricky having to walk, work around this plant, but you can still do it. Just a little bit at the top here, I think, just underneath the water line. Here around the soil just a little bit because you're right, right down low so there won't be terribly much light hitting the rocks down here. Not as much as there would be near the surface because of course as the light comes through the water it, um, it gets darker and darker. Less, more and more light's blocked by the water itself and this, the um, dissolved in the water. That's why the deeper down you get in the water, the darker it gets. Okay, swapping now to my warm grain number five in the polychromes, and I will take it up to put that down here, and we'll start blending in this shading with the highlighted areas. And because, as I said, I don't want this actually to be blue, I just want it tinted a bit blue for shading, I'll go over the whole thing.
I'm going to switch pencils here for a second. That's the um, warm grey 2 again. I'm just going to blush that in a bit more, seal it all down. Now I forgot to mention before, if you don't have a blue-grey, as in the uh, Derwent range, have a look through your pencils and see what you've got that's the closest equivalent. Often the sort of the dull, dark navy blues will do. You apply that lightly and um, go with the grey. I do recommend that before you do that, that um, committing it to the book, that you practice or have a bit of a go on a scrap piece of paper to see what's going to work. I think that's our rock stump from underneath the water. Now with these ivy leaves I'm going to play around with something a bit more playful with the application of colour. I'm going to choose several different colours and create a design in the leaf. Now because I want to have an experiment with it first before I commit it to this book, what I'm going to do, and this is one of the tricks I use when I'm colouring in, is I'll take a piece of photocopy paper and lay it over the page and I'll trace the shape that I intend to colour. As so. Now I've got a little guinea pig to experiment with. It's not perfect, doesn't have to be perfect, but um, it'll, it'll be good enough to show me what I'm doing to have a bit of a play with before I commit. So I'm going to make a couple here, so that I can, oh that's a bit, mm, not very well done, rub that one out. Doesn't have to be perfect, just has to be a bit of approximate shape, enough to give you an idea of how the piece is going to look when you commit the colours to your actual picture. There's another one, and I'll do a third one.
bit hard to see. There we go. This is good for simple shapes and just getting a general outline. I'll make that one a little bit thicker. There we go. Okay, that'll do. That's good enough for me to work with. Now the colours that I've chosen to do this with is some polychromous colours. This is a chrome oxide green and the ivory. This is another one of these pencils that if you're buying open stock I highly recommend you buying even if you don't have a polychroma set because the ivory is such a handy colour and if you haven't got a similar colour in the sets of pencils that you have this one really does come in handy and as you can see this one's getting on in its life uh, I use this one a lot. Now I'll give you an example of what I'm tending to do and I got this idea from playing around on other pieces that I've already coloured. So if I go back through my book, I'll come to this page here. And you see how I've coloured in these ivy leaves. I've not just coloured it in, I've created a sort of a pattern, a texture inside it. And I want to recreate it on the current picture because I quite like it. So let's experiment and see how I can do this. Same sort of thing with these shapes. So here is the little drawings we've made and here are the two pencils I've chosen. Now the first thing I did was I had an outline of the darker colour. I'll just make a outline around the outside, just so. The good thing about this system is that you can try this out with a few different colours first find what you like and don't like and then just use what you like and you haven't committed anything to the paper yet or um, you know ruined anything that you don't like okay there's the outline and now I've got a little bit of a pointy bit in the center here that's darker colored and then that it gradiates out to nothing on the sides A little bit darker in the center. Okay and then I'll take the cream color and I'll color in the rest of it going over the central bit that I've um, blushed in with the dark green color. Once that's done, I'll pick up this colour again, the dark green, and I'll go over the ivory and I'll make little seed shapes. Put one on each side for these little corner leaves and then I'll just do two on either side going up and one in the centre. I might just make that little core bit just a little bit darker to define it. So I like that. You can experiment with different colours if you like. I'm going to stick with these, but say we could do the same thing with a... This is a Pompeii Red. Same thing, I'll just go around the outside. This is a good thing to do. If you're not quite sure what colour you want to colour something in, just make a tracing of it and do a few test colours. So doing exactly the same thing using Pompeii Red now. making a bit of an outline and some thick colour up the middle in a spike and then blend it out a little bit at the sides now grab your cream or whatever other colour you want to use with it. I like the cream. Pop that over the top. Blend it all in.
and that one out a little bit more. And it's a very gently just blushing, blushing it in and a bit darker in the center. And again, making these little seed shapes, like little grains of rice, except a bit pointier at the end. And that gives you an interesting look to the leaf. And that one with the, that particular colour set, I would look at perhaps grabbing a yellow. This is a Faber Castell Polychromous Dark Naples Ochre. And I'll probably just give that a little zing by blushing that in down the centre. How's that? Isn't that an interesting looking leaf? Okay, that's another variation of colour, but for this particular picture, I'm going to stick with the greens for now. So that's the way I'm going to do it here. Just thinking I might bring a little zing to this as well. Let's have a look. I'm not using yellow, let's see what happens if we add a little bit of light green from the Polychromis range. Again, just blushing it in just to give it that other colour, a bit more direct, uh, dimension. And I quite like that actually, what do you think? I think I'm going to use that. There, that's what I mean by just experimenting. That just came to me on the spur of the moment and I like it. It just gives it a little bit more zing. So, happy with that, let's commit it to the book. Again, starting off with the Chrome Oxide Green. And as you could see, that is a kind of a dark, dull, bluish green. And I will go around the outer edges of my leaf with it. Piece of paper to lean on so that I don't smudge the pencil down the side of my hand there and get it smudgy and muddy up the colours. one let's do its partner at the same time hey okay? need a nice sharp pencil when you go around this and applying a fair amount of pressure to get a nice deep line center vein of the or the main vein of the leaf fairly dark and then blushing out towards the sides This one again. Okay, happy with those. So I will get my cream colour here. Oh sorry, not my cream colour. The cream colour is more yellow. This is the ivory. Okay, let's go over the top of everything with that. 
pressing light to medium pressure I think with this. It's a nice thing with these artist quality pencils, you really don't need a huge amount of pressure to get good coverage. Now, that looks pretty good just on its own, doesn't it? You could leave it like that if you like. I'm going to go ahead and finish it off with these little seed shapes. About the size of a little seed. Two, so there's one there, two there, one in the centre. Two more going down this side. And another one here. And the same for this one, two here, because they're around about the same size, these leaves, so that will fit, will fit nicely in. Okay, and we will grab, 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 grab our, take a hold of, pick up, a light green and I'm going to just blush a little bit of that in the center there you go just to pick out it's very subtle but I think it just brings it a bit more to life there adding that third color now if you haven't got an ivory color and you want to color along my suggestion to you, and it's going to be a bit tricky and you might want to practice it a bit, is perhaps use a brown colour and very, very, very lightly colour over where I've got the ivory with very, very light circles so that you're not leaving any streaky marks and then going over with a white. You won't get exactly the same as this, but you'll get something similar. You could try that, but I do recommend you try it on a separate piece of paper until you feel that you've got it right. And there you go, that looks much more interesting than just colouring in straight. And I will continue this to all parts of the page. As you can see, the ivory is over here as well, so I'll be doing it there. And at the bottom, I think it's going to look very nice all the way along the bottom with the similar shaped leaves. I won't do that now, we'll leave that till we get to that part. I'll just continue working in this quadrant here. Next I'm going to work on these leaves around here. I'm going to continue them more or less the same in the same kind of colours as I did around the top here. So we'll pop that there and I'll use the same sort of idea where this one here I'm using the mineral green from the uh, Derwent range and if I show you what that looks like Give it a bit of a scratch here and it's uh, an emerald sort of a green and the lighter green I'll be using the light green again the same color that I used on these leaves so that's the color combination I'm after for these ones and I'll start off with let's see I'll do the outline of the leaf first And then I'll do the central vein, sort of following along the little bit of the curve of the leaf. Do this one too, show you what I'm doing. Again, the outline and the central vein. And then I'll take the light green from the polychromous range and I'll just fill that in. Hmm. No, I want to have it more blurred in there, I think. We'll just blush that in a bit more, I think. Yeah, that's better. I like that better. Okay. 
It's a bit harder to lay the, uh, the dark green over the light green because the light green's already worked to start sealing the page and pushing down the tooth. So what I'll do on this one is the same sort of thing but I'll start to blush that down there a bit to start off with before I apply the light green. Okay, let's pop that one in now. Yeah, I like that better. It's got a, given it a little bit of a gradient. Okay, I'll continue with these colours throughout these leaves. Okay, now once again there are similar leaves on the other side of the page and they will be coloured in the same way to balance out the picture. But for now we're going to have a look at the stalks here for the leaves and for that I think I'm going to go for a light fawny sort of coloured brown. And let's have a look what have we got here. This is brown ochre from the Polychromis range. Let's have a little test. Yep, that's the sort of thing I want. So let's pop that one in. Now for the stems of this vine, I might actually do something a bit different. I'll pull out my ivory again and I'll just use that to colour it. There, just a little flick of ivory. There, happy with that. Now I think we're up to the frog here. Now what colours to do the frog? I want him to be a bright green so I think I might stick to my bright green palette. Keep using the light green because this is the brightest green I have. Mm. And I might use the mineral green as well, but I'll pop another green in there. Uh, this is another Faber-Castell polychromis. This is the leaf green. So if I get my little test shoot again, I'll we'll see how that compares. Ah, that's a lot brighter, isn't it? I think that one's going to make the uh, frog pop out a bit more. And we'll be using this darker green as more of a shading. So I think I'll start this time round with adding a little bit of shadow on the frog. So for shadow I might go just where the inside of his, here just underneath the thigh and on top of the, the calf. So where his, where his knee folds over there, just on the inside. Let's see now, probably just to add a little bit under his eyeballs. And a little bit just above his feet here, where his feet would be. You can see that. And just underneath these feet over here. Just to take him back a bit. Yeah, I think that'll do. Soften that as it goes up here. Right. Okay. Now I'll go with the lighter pencil now. And because the frog is a bit of a wet creature, he's a bit shiny, so I'm going to leave the, the little halo of white around the outside. So this is going to take a sharp pencil and a delicate application. 
just put your bright over near, over your shadow there just like that just trying to preserve a little bit of white around the outside same with his feet and going up his body here across his nose there and up over his eyes with a little pokey out bits there. okay now I'm going to take medium colored green and uh, the leaf green and I'll just bring that in a little bit here in between the margins of where the, the darker green and the paler green meet a little bit down here at the bottom of his upper lip. There we go. Maybe a tiny little blush up there just to give a tiny little gradient of his nose. There. Now this looks like it should be coloured in the dark green as well but I rather like the idea of leaving this uh, a paler colour, a cream or a yellow just to um, give a bit more definition to his face. So I'm going to now think I'll take hold of my poor little cream here. Oh goodness, that is such a sad pencil, isn't it? <laughs> okay, and we're going to add just a little bit around the bottom here and a little bit around his belly, I think. This is a bit of a shadow, so blue grey that we used on the rocks before. Sorry, it's right over the other side of the table, so I have to reach. I'm going to use the blue grey very, very gently just underneath his belly, just so it looks like it's going down and underneath him. It's got a bit of a shadow. Again, a um, sharp pencil helps here. Let's poke a little bit there in. And maybe just a little bit under his chin to make it look like that his face is sticking out from his neck. I don't know, do frogs have necks? I don't think they have necks, do they? I don't know. Anyway, this frog does have a bit of a neck. There we are. Okay, that's given him a bit more of a 3D look. See how useful these blue pencils are? I love this colour. There we are. I'm going to grab my cream again. Uh, polychromous cream. It's getting a bit too small to actually hold. Now I've left a little bit of white at the top so there's a bit of a colour gradient. His eyeballs, um, let's think, they really should be black. So tiny though, I'm a bit loath to actually use a um, pencil on there just in case I get black sort of like smearing around the outside. I'd be more inclined to get a, uh, a black um, fine liner and just blacken those in. So I won't do that right now. Okay, that's our frog done. And now let's do this piece of ground that he's sitting on. Not quite sure what Joanna had in mind when she drew this little bit. I'm thinking it probably might represent the earth directly underneath the frog. So I'm going to colour it in, in a brown. The colours I've chosen for this piece of earth now are again from the Faber-Castell Polychromis range and this is the Burnt Sienna and the burnt ochre. Now I'll show you what they are on my scrap piece of paper. This is a kind of a, a lighter reddish brown, medium to light reddish brown and this is a darker cooler brown. Right now I'm going to do a colour gradient here so I'll start with the lighter colour at the top and I'll gradu gradiate it down to the darker underneath. 
So ignoring the, um, the lines, and just considering those lines that she's put down here as texture, I will colour in the brown. Now this nice reddish brown contrasts very well with the frog and makes the frog pop a little bit from his grey background. And I believe that is because this is an orangish brown and orange is a fair distance away on the colour wheel from the green. So when you pair colours that are opposite each other on the colour wheel, or at least a fair distance away from each other, you'll find that the overall picture pops more. And when I say pop, I mean looks more visually attractive. Again, this has got, also got to do with the shade that you use and the tint in that shade. So experiment first on a piece of paper Hold it up to what you've already got and see how that works with the colours you've already laid down to see if it's compatible and it gives you the effect that you want. There's the first layer down and I'm going for the darker colour, the um, Burnt Sienna and I'm laying down that now on the base. Again, fairly dark to start off with down there and then I'll graduate it up, gradiate it up sorry, to make a nice colour gradation from the lighter um, more brownish, sorry, more reddish, orangish brown to this darker, cooler brown underneath. I think it might also hopefully give the impression of earth that's at the top to earth that's getting a bit darker and deeper below. Now I've been thinking what to do with these little row of circles here. And my inclination at the moment is just to leave them white as a feature. I'll see how I feel later on in the picture, whether they bother me or not, or whether something jumps out and tells me, oh no, it has to be this colour or that colour. But for the time being, because I'm not certain, I'm just going to leave them white. And that may work for the picture, or I may change my mind later on. again with the burnt ochre yeah that's nice I like that okay now leaving these white line of teeny little beads I'm going to move on to the fish. Now, the fish to me looks a bit like a salmon. And one of the brightest colored salmon I know has the uh, sort of a pinky, I think they call the rainbow salmon. They're sort of a, now let's think if I get this right. They're sort of a dark green on top and dark green on top and they've got kind of like a light green and a pink stripe going down the middle. Now this won't be a photo reproduction of exactly the kind of colours that a rainbow salmon looks like but I'm going to base it on the sort of colour scheme I think a rainbow salmon looks like. So it's back to choosing colours now. I've chosen some colours for the fish and they're all polychromous colours. I'm going to do a deep cobalt green, a rose carmine, oh, hang on there is a derwent one in here, uh, a derwent uh, pink madelake, oops running away from me, uh, yellow glaze and uh, that one was a polychromous and one of my favorite pencils again the ivory. I'll start off just by putting some of the deep cobalt green across the top of the fish here. Give them a bit of a dark back, a dark coloured back. Just 
just fade it out a little bit towards his face. Next, I'll get the yellow glaze and I'm going to blend a line of that in at the bottom of the deep cobalt green. This yellow glaze is a greenish, sort of a very, very lightly greenish yellow. You'll find some of your, your yellows look more warm, more orangish, and some of them look more greenish. This one's slightly greenish. It sort of gives it a fluorescent look. Yeah, that's blended in. I'm just going to put a little bit more of this cobalt green here just to get rid of that feeling of there being a line of green there and just soften it a little bit into the lemon glaze. Strengthen that along there. Next I'll get my um, pink matter lake from my Dermot range. Uh, if you don't have this one, don't worry too much. Just go ahead with the um, Rose Carmine. I like this one because it's just a little bit lighter and I sort of help to blend in the two. But you could do it without if you wanted to. I'm going to pop this just underneath my yellow. should just where it's hard to see it but just where the pink and the yellow meet you'll get a slight orange tinge which will help to gradiate the yellow into the pink you can see he's looking little fish is looking very salmony at the present let's go under there a bit I'm going to go in with the Rose Carmine now and make just, just a little bit dark, a little bit brighter. It's not a salmon, is it? It's a trout, rainbow trout. I've been saying salmon, I meant trout. <laughs> fish's belly I'm just going to do with the ivory. I'll extend that to his face too. I'll bring that cobalt I think all the way down to his, almost all the way down to his mouth. his fins I'm going to just run a bit of cobalt green along the edges of the fins and then just let a little bit of a gradient there getting darker right at the edge and getting softer as you go back to the body I'll do that with all four all three of the fins and the tail as well little line that she's blocked in I'm going to color as a solid cobalt green and just leave a little bit of blended not blended a little bit of a softer green 
next to it. Now, the bit that connects with the body here, I'm just going to put a little bit of the yellow, but I'm going to leave a margin of white in the middle. of my ivory again and I'll just blend that all in. Now with his eyes, I'm just going to pop a little bit of the pink, just leaving a little bit of the white along the top here. I'll put the pink here and I'll put the yellow on the bottom. Yeah, happy with that. Now the stripe down the middle, I was going to leave that white but I don't think I like it white so hmm. I might just, um, not quite sure, because they don't usually have stripes going down the middle, do they? Um, I'll try something different. Let's see if this works. I'll get my cobalt. Oh yeah, that's not too bad. I'll just colour it in dark with the cobalt. And the same for his gills. Now, you see we've got the little white dots here. Now you may have run over them a bit with your pencil. Don't be too concerned about that. At the end of colouring it in, the whole picture, I'm going to show you how I go in with a white Uniball um, gel pen. That's the Signo gel pen. And I'll just dot the white ink in all the dots to bring, out, bring them back to white again. But I won't do that now. I'll leave that as one of the, the finishing touches of this page. Next we'll work on these reeds down the bottom. We'll start with these two reeds at the bottom here. And for that I've chosen a, a polychromous middle cadmium red, which is a kind of a, a slightly dull brownish red tone, orangey brownish. And this cinnamon, also from the polychromous range, is sort of a, a darker, a Caucasian skin tone. So we'll use those and I'm going to use the cinnamon to, well, this time I'll use it on the stalk. As such. And I'm going to blush some in at the base of each of these leaves. Just a little and again sort of softening up as I go to the middle of the leaf. A bit darker right where the leaf connects with the stalk and lighter as you go up. take the middle cadmium red and I'll just put that on the tips and just blend it into the cinnamon colour. As you can see this is a very rich lush red but it's kind of a, an orangey brownish red but it's still quite bright.
that's one and we'll do this one Next we're going to work on these reeds here. Now I'm going to colour these all in the same, I'm going to consider those to be a bunch of the same species of reed. So we'll choose some colours for those. The colours I've chosen for these reeds are the Earth Green Yellowish from the Faber-Castell Polychromis range, my Derwent Cedar Green, and the chrome oxide green again from Faber Castell. Don't be too worried if you don't have the same colours just match them as closely as you can with the pencils that you've got you'll get round about the same effect. Now with the earth green yellowish I'm going to use this to put some little highlights into this this little clump of reeds here so I'll drop some of this colour where I would think the light would strike these leaves the most. So basically right on the top. Maybe a little bit here. making it more intense at the tips and feathering it down a little bit so you can blend in the next shade. Although this is a duller shade of light green, it will look a lot brighter in contrast with the, the grey behind it. spread a lot of that around we'll see how we go okay I'll take the next shade up which was the um, cedar green and start applying it underneath where I put the lighter green just blending it up into it now the Derwents are a slightly harder pencil or actually a quite a bit harder pencil than the polychromis so get the same density I have to put a little bit more pressure and put a few more layers on. And what I'm doing basically is just adding the next shade down from the green so that we're heading to what is basically a bit lighter looking at the top and rather darker looking down at the base. Kind of the opposite of the grass we did at the top only the placement of the, the colours is going to be slightly more random because these are wavy fronds underneath the water. But basically the same idea.
Okay, I'll go in with the lighter green again, just to bring it out a bit more. And I'll just, I think I'll go over the whole lot because I've found the, uh, the cedar green is just a slightly dull and if I put the light green over everything it'll brighten it up a little bit. Okay, now I'm ready for the darkest green, and that was the chrome oxide green. This is a dark, fairly dull green, and it'll work well as the base of these reeds. bends to be a bit more of a shadow. I'll leave these central veins the brighter green just to bring them out a little bit. And there's our reeds. Next we'll move on to the sword. First I'll start off with the hilt. For that I'm going to use a Derwent a Terracotta and a Derwent Venetian Red. These are a kind of a cool uh, reddish browns. Well that one is sort of more coolish and that one's a little bit lighter. I'm also going to use my ivory again just to do a little bit of highlighting. So I'll start with that. Now, considering that the light's coming down this way, it's really going to strike the pommel rather than, than the hilt. So, we'll just put a little bit of the ivory down either side. Don't need much. And then, I think we'll go for the Venetian red. And we'll just make a line of that up the middle. take our terracotta and just blend that into the sides a little bit. Now I'm trying to look at creating a leathery look for this so I've picked leathery sort of colours. There we go that'll do. Now for the metallic parts of the sword. I've chosen cool colours. I've got the uh, Faber-Castell Cool Grey 2, the Faber-Castell Cool Grey 6 and the darkest one is, no sorry that's the 5 and this one is the Cool Grey 7. We'll start off with the pommel and to do that I'm going to consider that the light is striking it here. I don't want to put an ivory on it because it's metal so I'll just leave it white and I'll do a dot of the darkest colour here at the base that's with the cool grey 7 and then I'll just put a little bit of the cool grey 5 and finish it off with the cool grey 
to being careful to leave a halo of white around it. See, and that will give it a sort of a shiny metallic look. Right, for the hilt, you'll pop in a line of the cool grey just underneath, once again leaving a little line of white right before the ink line. Pop that in there. Go for the middle grey. Now you're working in a very tiny area so you want really sharp pencils to do this. Because what I'm trying to do is put a slight gradient in here but still preserve the white outline. And I think that's good enough. Now for the actual sword itself, we're going to do a little bit, something a little bit different to make it look like it's shiny metal. And instead of just colouring down the shaft, I'm going to make little reflective lines of colour. So it looks like it's shining metal. And I'm going to alter, alternate the greys that I use and I'll be throwing in a little bit of blue just to give it that really shiny metallic look. So it looks a bit like steel. Now I'll start off with the darkest colour and I'm just going to cross over diagonally from there to there, sort of... Oh, what am I doing it at? Um, I'm not very good at angles but not straight across, sort of about at a 90 degree angle to the lines going down. And I'll do several of those, such. And you'll see the effect that I get when I finish. There, there's some shiny lines. Now let's get the uh, number seven sorry that's the whoops that was the number seven I just used this is the number four and again just behind or below the dark line just put in a little bit of the grey This is a clever little trick for making some things look metallic. It depends on the shape of the surface how you would do this, but this, this works well with things that are long and flat. So I'm just going to add a little bit more of this grey under here because it'll be in a shadow a little bit because it's sitting underneath the hilt. Now I'll take my blue and this will make the um, sword jump out a little bit. I don't want to use too much of this. I just want to stripe in some blue like that. Just at odd intervals. And that, as you can see, suddenly it brings the blade to life. Now finally I'm going to take the lightest colour of the greys, the number two, and I'll just end the shading a little bit. I want to leave some white, particularly around the, the darkest grey, but I'll just fill in most of the rest of the sword. Now isn't that clever? Using a trick of colouring to create a metallic look. There you go, and as you can see I've got these bands here of white that I've left to make the sword look really shiny. And I might just add a touch of blue to the pommel. Not much, really subtle, right at the top there. And maybe a touch of blue here to the hilt. There. Now, when I go in with the white gel pen, I'm just going to dot a few little dots of sparkle around it, and that'll help to make it look even more metallic. And that concludes this week's instalment in Colouring Along with Peter. If you've enjoyed it, we'll be working on this side next week. Now, if you want to get a little bit ahead, we will be repeating the design that we've done on these ivy leaves over onto these ones, and the same colours that we use for the rock as well. 
So what I'll probably do is just recap very quickly how to do those areas and then I'll just speed color the rest because you've already seen me do this side. Uh, if you want to jump ahead and just do it, if you feel confident, go ahead and do it. And until next time, enjoy all your coloring adventures and happy coloring!